I see the timer has started, so I guess I'll get started. Um, my name is David Baker. I'm the tech lead of the Java and Kotlin ecosystem team at Google, and I'm here to talk about JSpecify, Java Nullness Annotations, and Kotlin. Uh, first off, um, what is JSpecify? Who are JSpecify? It's a working group. It's not, I work at Google, but it's not just Google. It's uh, got people from a number of different companies that you may have heard of, someplace called JetBrains. Um, Oracle, Meta, Uber, Broadcom produces the Spring Framework. You may have heard Sebastian talk about JSpecify yesterday. Um, and uh, what we do, what we are doing, is we are producing a standard set of annotation types for static analysis um, and language interop across JVM languages. Um, but the first question you might have if you saw this talk is why are we talking about Java nullness annotations at KotlinConf? It's not JavaConf. Uh, and the short answer is platform types. Platform types, you know what they are, uh, you hate them. We're doing just a quick review. Colin has a null safe type system, which is great, unless you have any Java libraries in your class path. Does anybody have that problem? Okay, so very, very quick review. Uh, you have a Java API that looks something like this. You don't know the nullness of any of the type uh, components of that API. So when you call that from Kotlin, you don't know whether you're getting back a list of strings or a list of nullable strings or a nullable list of strings or a nullable list of nullable strings. You have no idea whether this is going to throw a null pointer exception at runtime. Kotlin lets you guess. It lets you choose any of these things and doesn't complain. And then you end up having a bad time. So we don't like that. So the answer to that is to use JSpecify nullness annotations on your Java APIs. Here's just a simple example. I'm going to take you through a little bit more. Um, if you annotate that API with at nullable and at not null, you end up with something that looks like this. And then when you call that from your Kotlin code, Kotlin makes sure you only call it the way it was intended to be called, and you only use those types the way they were intended, and you have no platform types here, even though you're calling a Java API. And that's good. So uh, that's the basics. I'm going to take you through a little bit of a whirlwind overview of the way JSpecify looks at nullness. It's a little different from the way Kotlin looks at nullness, although it is compatible with that, um, because, of course, it's got to cover Java and Java nullness analysis as well. So taking you through this simple example. Here we have a Java API. It's got a couple of methods. They return who knows what kind of nullable types. Everything's problem. If you use JSpecify's nullness annotations, at nullable and at not null, as I showed you before, now you have a happy uh, null safe type that you can call. But you'll notice that there are a lot of annotations there. And the annotations have a lot more characters than a simple question mark. Um, and so this is a simple example, and it's already so much noise that it's hard to read what else is going on. Uh, imagine more complex examples, and your eyes are going to start hurting. So um, there is a way to set a reasonable set of defaults. What you can do is add at null marked to a class or a Java package or a Java module, if that's what you want to do. Um, and now you get the same results. You get a non-nullable string returned from method one, and you get a non-nullable list returned to met from method two without having nearly as many annotations. Now, it's not quite as simple as anything without an annotation is not null. Um, it's more complex than that. I'm going to show you one example in the next slide. Um, but it's more complex than that, and that's why the annotation is called null marked and not default not null. All right. The next example that gets a little more complex is parameterized types, type parameters. So here's an example of something that is not is simply not null or nullable. If you have a parameterized type with a type parameter whose upper bound is nullable, and yes, that's how you spell it in JSpecify, um, you can have a method like foo that returns a plain t. Now, that's not annotated, but it's not not null, and it's not nullable. It all depends on what the type argument is for t. If you have a parameterized of not null string, then foo will return a not null string. If you have a parameterized of nullable string, then foo will return a nullable string, which is what you want. Kotlin gives you something like this too, but now we have it for Java as well. Um, and you can override that with nullness projections. So you can say that regardless of whether you have a parameterized null st nullable string or a parameterized not null string, I want bar to return the nullable version of that. Or and I want baz to return the not null version of that. Um, okay. 
And then JSpecify also has documentation and rules for the semantics for legacy uh, types that don't have nullness information. What Kotlin calls parametric, uh, excuse me, platform types, uh, and what we call unspecified nullness. So here in an unannotated class, you're back to method one that returns string, but even method two that returns a type parameter, we have rules about the fact that even in, if you have an instance of unannotated with not null string, you might think, all right, well, it returns not null string, method two. It doesn't, it'll actually return a platform type. It's not great, but at least it's got speci uh, specific rules that everybody can agree with and understand and follow. There's another annotation called null unmarked. It's a way to back out of null marked. Um, that's going to be helpful if you have a large Java, uh, Java API surface that you want to annotate, and you don't want to do it all at once. You want to do it bit by bit because you only have so many hours in the day. You can use null unmarked to sort of back out. Okay, so there are only four annotations. Um, there is, uh, you know, these are the sort of kinds of nullness. There's a lot more detail, but this is only a lightning talk. Uh, there is a website with documentation and a tutorial. Um, anyway, so I'm going to move on past the example to some, some other important stuff. You might be asking yourself, don't nullable annotations already exist? You've seen at nullable before. You've probably seen at not nullable before. Why do we need a new set of annotations? Well, there are a lot of possibilities. These are just some of them. I pulled this off of the Kotlin website. I'm sure there are more. Um, and the question is, why don't we just use one of these and just try to use that everywhere? Um, there are a few problems with this. One is, a lot of these packages annotations are quite old, uh, and they predate Java 8 when Java introduced type use annotations. So you can't, all of these ones in red here, um, you can't use them to make a list of nullable strings. You can't put that annotation inside angle brackets. Uh, so that means it's not really that useful. Um, the other annotations, uh, a lot of them don't have that problem, but a lot of these annotations, most of them in fact, are designed and developed by providers of a specific nullness analysis tool, right? Find bugs, checker framework, IDEs like Eclipse and IntelliJ count as a nullness analysis tool, right? And they, have, they want to do some good nullness analysis. They want to give you that feature, so they give you some annotations. Now, that's great if you, writing your own first-party Java code, use one of those tools. You would go ahead and use that tool's annotations, and you'd have a fine time. A problem, however, is what if you are a developer of an open-source Java library that perhaps I, maybe you're not a developer of an open source Java library, but if you use open source Java libraries, those author, authors have to think about that. Now they may use, and hopefully they do use, a Java nullness an analysis tool to search for nullness bugs in their code, but how do they annotate their APIs so that you can use them? Well, here's a problem. All of these different providers of nullable annotations, they usually spell them the same way, but they have slightly different semantics. Not usually for nullable and not nullable, those are pretty clear, but for things like what are the defaults if there's no annotation and how do you specify that? For things like how do you deal with type parameter bounds or wildcard bounds? What happens when you have an overriding method? There's a lot of subtlety there and most of these, a lot of these annotations don't even really document the subtlety uh, that is expressed in their tool. The documentation is run the tool and see what errors it gives you, which is not great. It's again, it's great if that's all you're doing for yourself, but if you have an open source library, you do not know what tool your users use. And in fact, some of your users use one tool, some of them use the other tool, and so no matter how you annotate your APIs, some of your users are gonna call and complain, or text and complain, or come to your house and complain. Uh, and so that's not a great place to be. So basically, none of these existing annotation packages is actually standard. Um, and that's where JSpecify comes in. Our annotations are actually a standard. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about this famous XKCD cartoon. I love this XKCD cartoon, right? There are 14 competing standards. Let's have one to rule them all and, and deprecate the others. And now we have 15 competing standards, right? This is a good cartoon. It applies to things like AC chargers. Um, it doesn't apply to our situation. The main reason it doesn't apply to our situation is because of what I said before, none of the existing annotations is a standard. It wasn't even trying to be a standard. There was one that was attempted to be a standard, that's JSR 305. It never got released. 
Everybody depends on it. Its status is dormant, do not use. Okay, so maybe that attempted to be a standard, but it isn't. And the rest are tool specific and they're not a standard. So J specifies annotations are a standard because they have a documented specification, not only of how to use it, there's a lot of documentations on, if you're a library author, here's where you put the annotations. There is a, a specification for tool providers, for language analysis tools, for how to interpret those annotations. What are the semantics? It gets very hairy. It's not a very user-friendly document. It is a document for language tools providers. So this set of annotations is not tool-specific and has a documented semantics. A lot of tool providers and library authors participated in this working group to design these annotations. It took a long time. Um, and, uh, but as a result of those two things, we expect that eventually all Java Nautilus analyzers, in addition to an understanding their own annotations, will also understand JSpecify's annotations and will understand it in the same way. Uh, they will ag agree on exactly what a nullness an annotated API really means. We released 1.0 uh, last July. There are already around 500 Maven artifacts that use it. Uh, here are some example libraries and tools that have already either committed to using it or are using it, including some that we produce, like Guava and Truth, others from Google, Chromium and Jetpack. The next major version of Spring is going to switch from their bespoke nullness, an uh, nullness annotations to JSpecifies. There's some other examples. IntelliJ, Android Studio, Eclipse, all recognize JSpecify annotations. ESOP, which is a fork of the Checker framework, which is a Java static analysis tool, recognizes it. Nullaway, and more. Um, there's language support. Oracle, through OpenJDK, was a participant in the working group. So we, they are aware of the model that we've built. They are working on a future Java language nullness feature that may or may not come to fruition, but the model that they have was informed by the model that we have. It actually got a lot simpler after our conversations with them. That's good because if you adopt JSpecify's annotations, you're on a good path to eventually supporting Java's language feature down the road. Also, the Kotlin compiler treats JSpecify annotated Java code as null safe and reports errors and does correct type inference as of version 2.1. Okay. To review, how does this help Kotlin users? I'm talking about Java a lot. Kotlin users. So, number one, the more the Java libraries that you use, use any nullness annotations, but nullness annotations that we believe they will use, the safer your Kotlin code is. The fewer null pointer exceptions you have, which is what we all want. And the second thing is, if you have Java code in your application or in your code base, and you're planning to convert it at some point to Kotlin code, you know you're going to have to first figure out the nullness of every type in that Java code. Now, you could do that as you translate, or you could do it in two steps, which I think is going to be more efficient. You first figure out the nullness situation with your Java API. Maybe you run a Java uh, static analysis tool to find all of the bugs that you didn't even know were there in your implementation. Make it better for your Kotlin users that already use that Java, and then in a second phase, it'll be much easier to translate that null annotated Java to Kotlin. Okay, so that's nullness. JSpecify is not only about nullness, right? We're about all sorts of domains where static analysis is already used and already uses annotations to indicate how to interpret various semantics and make everybody's code healthier and avoid bugs and all that kind of stuff. We are going to move on. We picked nullness first because I don't know why. It certainly wasn't easy. It took a long time. We're going to move on to other domains. One of them is checking return values. I think there was just a talk, or there is currently a talk about that in another room, and I think they mentioned that Kotlin is going to be doing this uh, across the language. We had these, some of these conversations. Anyway, we're going to be putting some of that in JSpecify. There are other domains that we may be going for, like immutability. Um, we have more to do after nullness because we fixed it. All right. Finally, you can get involved. JSpecify is open source. We have a website. Uh, it's jspecify.dev. It really should be .org, but there's some paper I have to push to make that happen. Um, we're on GitHub. You can see all of our code. Um, you can help. So you can help in a few specific ways. If you contribute to open source Java libraries, go add JSpecify annotations to them. You will be helping your users. You will be helping the ecosystem. If you, have, if you use a static analysis tool uh, and it doesn't support JSpecify, please file a feature request to them. If it supports JSpecify and you notice a bug, please file a bug. Tell us, we'll file a bug. We don't write the tools, but we can help. 
Specifically, we have a conformance test framework that we uh, are, we're working on. It's there. It's not really complete. That's a specific thing. If anybody wants some specific tasks, come see me. Uh, and again, we're going to have other domains that we're going to attack besides nullness. Come join the conversation. Propose another domain. If you have an idea for something you think will help the entire Java and Kotlin ecosystem, uh, come talk to us about it. And you know, it's a lot of work, but we, we would invite you to do it. Um, and I am out of time and out of slides, so thank you very much. Don't forget to vote. I'll stick around here for a couple minutes. Thank you. And I'll be at the Google, I'll be at the Google booth for the next hour if you have even more questions. Thanks.